Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, once again, and all specially invited guests. Welcome. It's here, back to the beginning, too. For some station identification, Project Probe Ministries is a local, non-denominational Christian apologetics organization which has been operating in Barbados for the past 17 years. The name Probe delineates our purpose, which is providing research for objectively battling error. We facilitate lectures and discussions on various important issues of controversy to the Christian faith, which at the same time caters to the interests of the general public. Through these educational sessions, people are equipped with tools which are needed to help affect positive change in our churches and the wider society. In 2015, we hosted Back to the Beginning One. The featured speaker was former atheist and evolutionist Dr. Russell Humphreys. The focus of that conference re revolved around issues of cosmology, the age of the earth, and, the s and solving the problem of distant starlight in a young universe. Tonight, two years later, we are pleased to host Back to the Beginning Two, in which we turn our attention to issues related to the origin of life, human civilization, the search for extraterrestrial inter intelligence, and yes, UFOs. Why, you may ask, the simple answer, there's a battle on for the beginning. Modern society is constantly faced with the age-old challenges of conflicting worldviews about man's true origin, purpose, and destiny. Our answers to the following questions helps to shape our view of, of an approach to life and the Christian faith. Was mankind created by God, or did we evolve from animals? Does ancient Egyptian history falsify the claims of the Bible? Are we alone in the universe? Is there life on other planets? Are UFOs alien spacecraft? These are the issues this conference will be addressing tonight. Tonight, we've invited our featured speaker for this conference, former evolutionist, Mr. Gary Bates, to present some of the scientific evidence that has stacked up against evolution in his talk entitled, Myth Busting the Icons of Evolution. After his lecture, there will be a 15 minute break for you to have a chance to purchase equipment books and DVDs from our book tables in the foyer. During the break, you can take a sheet, you can, there's a table to my right, your left, where you can take a sheet, pen, paper, provided there, write your questions which you may have and drop them in the question box and Gary will answer your questions during the Q&A &A segment after the break. We now call on Mr. Vis Vincent Smith, an executive member of Project Pro Ministries, to formally introduce Mr. Gary Bates. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Mr. Gary Bates hails from Australia and has been speaking on the creation evolution issue since 1990. In 2002, he was invited to join Creation Ministries International full time and eventually became its head of ministry. In 2009, Gary and some of his family relocated to America to head up the U.S. Office of Creation Ministries International as its CEO. He was also elected to the position of CEO of Creation Ministries International Worldwide and International Federation of Ministries. Gary is also on the editorial team for Creation Magazine, which now has subscribers in over 110 countries. He has authored and co-authored six books on the creation versus evolution debate. 
wants a convinced evolutionist, the creation message had a dramatic impact on Gary's life. He is now a biblical creationist with a heart to communicate this life changing information to the average person on the street. He has been married to Francis for 36 years and they have four adult children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Gary Bates. Thank you, Vincent. I don't need that one, I think I'm good. Wow, all so formal. You know, us Aussies, you should know, we're pretty laid back. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was a very long intro. And, uh, but anyway, we'll get going. I'll see if I can get my talk up here. I've got all this stuff that was just put on there a moment ago. Here we go. Well, I appreciate you coming out tonight, folks. Um, it's a pleasure to come to Barbados. I've traveled to many countries of the world speaking on this subject. I haven't been here before, and I'm very pleased to be here because back in Atlanta, where I live, it's uh, below zero at the moment. So it wasn't uh, too difficult a choice to come. Of course, I didn't know the weather was going to be like that. You know, I'm going to talk fairly quickly tonight. I think most of you should be used to the Aussie accent. Uh, you've had plenty of Aussie visitors over here beating your cricket teams, uh, etc. Uh, I had to throw that in, sorry. And, uh, but anyway, I've got good news for you about the Australian accent. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, we're all going to be speaking it in heaven, so get used to it, all right? All right. I'm going to move fairly quickly tonight because I want to show you in this first talk, and I just want to say, if you hear from a church, if there's any pastors, this is not the kind of normal church talk that I would give for a first time. I want to really talk more tonight about the scientific evidence for creation, or particularly against evolution. Uh, because we're all taught evolution as a fact. It is the standard you know, view. It's the ruling paradigm of the sciences. And I want to show you that, in fact, after many, many years, that evolution and the very icons of evolution that we're told support evolutionary theory actually uh, really don't work. And we have lots more information, but a little bit about CMI. We actually have offices in seven countries of the world. That was the federation that Vincent alluded to. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I think we employ more scientists than any Christian ministry in the world. And all of those scientists all got their degrees, their PhDs in secular universities, just like their evolution-believing counterparts. And that should tell us something straight away. The issue is really not about science. You know, there's nothing new under the sun, a wise man once said. The issue, it's always about God. That's it. It's about God. And you're going to see tonight that at the end of the day, uh, you know, as the scriptures say, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. And I don't mean that in an offensive way, but I want to show you that the evidence is all around us for a creator. Um, we are an information ministry. We produce information. We're faith funded just by ordinary mums and dads like yourself who support our speakers and scientists to research and write and to go into churches. In our US office last year, we visited 337 churches to take the message of creation out. And, uh, you know, we're more than happy to come and do that here and encourage Project Probe to do the same thing. It's good to see that you actually have a ministry in this country uh, to do that. Um, the books out there, we just brought a small selection of some of our key resources with us. Uh, I'm going to mention some of those at the end and I just want to say I'm not here to sell you a bunch of books. That's not how we fund our ministry. Uh, being an information ministry, we produce information for two major reasons. To equip you and your families and secondly so you can use that information to reach others. One of the great sources of information is our website. And uh, on that website, there's about 35 years worth of creation information, which is how long our ministry has been going. In fact, that equates to about 12 and a half thousand articles at the present count, and it's all free. All free. You can go up there on the, uh, if you look at the screen, you go up there on the search engine. Oh, here we go. 
get my pointer working. There's a search engine there and you can type in, you know, what about dinosaurs? Who did Cain marry? There's a topics button. When you click on that, a box drops down and they are the major categories. Everything from ape men, aliens, genetics, geology, zoology and everything in between. And the lead article changes every single day. We've got free multimedia and you are free to share that information. Now I'm going to give you the web address. It's a very, very difficult web address to remember. So I'm sure you Bajans can get the hang of this. I'll put it up for you. Creation.com. <laughs> Reckon you can remember that one. So for example, you know, if you're watching the TV and, you know, the Discovery Channel, like they did a few months ago, said, wow, look, we found this cave in South Africa and we've got about, uh, you know, 20 more specimens, what they believed, you know, missing links, uh, apes to human type fossils. Where do you go to get an answer like that? I mean, for you Christians here, no disrespect, but your pastors are, are theologians. And so that's why we are a specialist ministry to help you. And usually you'll have an answer on our website within a couple of days. We're going to do a couple of things tonight to save you time at the end. We have a free email news called InfoBytes. And again, we use it for equipping you and then we hope you use it for evangelism. And here's an article I wrote about the earthquake in Haiti a few years ago. Remember that? Now it's interesting, we allow comments at the bottom of our articles and, and even Christians contacted me and they said, well, you know, we think God judged Haiti because they're a voodoo worshipping nation, something like that. Well, I have a bit of a problem with an answer like that because first it presumes we know the mind of God. I mean, I don't know whether he did or he didn't. And for us Christians, when we try to look at our world, we should always be driven back into what the Bible says. Use the Bible as a lens for understanding and interpreting our world. And for example, I can look in the New Testament in Romans 8. It tells me the whole creation groans and travails under the weight of sin. And do you know where that passage is actually pointing back to? It's pointing back to the book of Genesis. In fact, specifically Genesis chapter 3, the fall. And we're all familiar with the fact that Adam and Eve were cursed and you know Eve's uh, pain in childbearing would increase. But... It says the ground was cursed, the plants were cursed, the animals were cursed, the creation was cursed. That's why bad things happen to us, ladies and gentlemen. It should be a reminder to us when we look out that something's wrong with creation. Death is not normal. It, it was a, an intrusion into God's perfect world. So when the ground was cursed, that's why we get tsunamis. And that's why the Bible also says today should be the day of salvation because you just don't know when a giant wave is going to hit your island or when an airplane is going to fly into your building. So, we, uh, as I said, we have articles where we try to deal with current events in the news and you can use that to reach others. And in a moment, my good-looking volunteers are going to come round and pass some sign-up sheets. Uh, we send out our info, info bites about once every two weeks. Uh, you'll get our US version here, and all I need is your name, your email address. If you've got a postcode or something like that, uh, you can put on there, do so as well. And um, if uh, the volunteers want to come forward, they're going to circulate the sheets. I'd ask you to just fill them out, pass them back, uh, and hold them up at the end. They'll collect them back off, off you, and I'll get on with the talk. Now, if you ever want to subscribe, of course, it's just a click of a button to take you off there. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard I'm a former evolutionist. In fact, I was a pretty rabid evolutionist. And uh, when I heard my first creation presentation, do you know my first reaction was actually one of anger? I actually wasn't hostile to the view that there might be a designer. I just believed that evolution was a great mechanism to explain everything there was. But the reason I was angry is I felt like I hadn't been given all the information. And really, that's it. Most people believe in evolution because that's all they've ever been taught. In your public schools and in your universities and every Western country in the world, evolution is taught as a scientific fact. So how can people make an informed decision unless they get access to at least another source of information? Now, people might argue and say, well, you can't argue like that because, you know, evolution is science and creation is religion. Well, we'll deal with that in a moment. You know, we've seen pictures like this that somehow this is based upon real evidence that we find out there, that, you know, evolution is all about death and struggle, commonly called survival of the fittest, and, you know, here we are, we're nothing more than evolved pond scum down at the bottom. It makes you feel kind of special there, doesn't it? That's the evolutionary story. Pond scum to professors. The Bible 
says in six 24-hour days that God made everything we see in our physical universe. Now, when I became a Christian, I was still an evolutionist, so I tried to fit those millions of years and the evolutionary processes in the Bible, and I'm sure we've all tried that at some stage, but I just put up this table for you to show that the order is wrong, for example. So, you know, just take point five there. Dinosaurs. Everyone's fascinated with dinosaurs. We're told that dinosaurs evolved into birds. But actually, here we have birds created on day four and five of, uh, sorry, on day um, five of creation, the sea and the flying creatures, and land animals and man, which must mean dinosaurs, creatures that move along the ground, were created on day six. So you see the order's wrong. Dinosaurs did not evolve into birds. According to the Bible, birds pre-existed before dinosaurs. And there's lots of examples like that. And here's the big issue. I mean, I could just do a talk on those. But the big challenge for all of us in a secular environment, politically correct world, is when we're trying to defend our faith, we get questions. Questions from people. Let, let, let's just think about some of those questions. How many of you have been witnessing to unbelievers, or maybe your children have asked questions, or maybe you've had questions yourself like this. You know, well, if the Bible's true, and we all came from Adam and Eve, who did Cain marry? Or if the Bible's true, we all came with Adam from Adam and Eve, where did the different races come from? How come I can't see dinosaurs mentioned in the Bible? Or this one, you know, if God's a God of love, why does he allow all the bad things to happen in the world? Why is there death and suffering? Ever had questions like that? Well, just, just indulge the little Aussie up here. If you've ever, and I'm not going to pick anybody out, don't worry. Let's just do a poll. If you've ever had received questions like that, just pop your hands in the air and show me, please. Now, would you just keep them up? Because I'd love you to take a look around. And I only asked you four questions. And people have dozens of questions. You see, here's the issue. If you can't trust the first few pages of the Bible, where does the truth begin in Scripture? And I'm going to show you tonight that Genesis is actually foundational. What you believe about Genesis will actually affect what you believe with the rest of Scripture. And the Bible gives us a command that we should be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. And we tend to think about that in just kind of biblical apologetics, but we're living in an age of rationalism, where people think that science is going to solve all our problems. But there's a connection. You see, if God is not creator, if he really didn't make us, then why should I obey any rules? If it's survival of the fittest, why, why should I love my neighbour? You know, I mean, I'd only be obeying evolutionary laws. I mean, and there's been classic examples of that, like Adolf Hitler, who killed, you know, 65,000 of his own countrymen because they were handicapped or ill or infirm. And they didn't, he said their continued survival was not in the best interest of the nation. He applied evolution to uh, society. By the way, there are calls to do that again today. And if you realise that, the world's leading Darwinian evolutionists are saying that we should terminate pregnancies early if we see that children are less fit, for example. You can go to creation.com and look at that. Well, here's a well-known atheistic apologist. You might recognise the actor Bruce Willis. I think he kind of says it pretty well. He said they, talking about organised religion and churches, used to hang the whole thing on one hook. If you don't do these things, if you don't act morally, he says, you're going to burn in hell. Then look what he says. But unfortunately, what we know about science, anyone who probably thinks at all doesn't believe in fire and brimstone. So organised religion has lost, up its, lost, up, lost that voice to hold up that moral hand. Do you remember the days when the church used to, Christianity used to kind of dominate our laws and our society? You know, he's saying, no, you've lost that right now because science shows the Bible is wrong. You know, and a lot of us have said over the years, you know, Christians, you know, well, it's really not that important. You know, just preach Jesus. Well, amen, I'm all for that. But then what happens when you get one of those questions like I just asked you a moment ago, right? You see, questions, while you think they're a challenge, I want you to think about them in another way. That's what I want you to do. As we go through tonight, think about them as an opportunity. Because guess what? We can answer those questions. We don't have to shy away from those questions. You might not know the answers there and then, but you know what? You can undertake to get somebody an answer. You can get them a book or a tract or a DVD or something. 
But in terms of it not being important, check this out. Do you know there are over 100 references to the book of Genesis in the New Testament? Specifically Genesis 1 or 11, that's talking about creation, you know, the fall, the flood, the dispersal after the flood, the Tower of Babel. There are 60 references. In fact, every New Testament author references Genesis 1 to 11. Every Genesis 1 to 11 chapter is referenced in the New Testament and the Lord Jesus himself referenced Genesis 1 to 11 on 16 occasions. Wow, do you think they thought it was important? i tell you why. Because biblical history, when I say history, these are real events that occurred in real space and real time, give us our Christian doctrine today. So I want you to think about Genesis like a foundation for everything that follows in Scripture, everything that we believe. So let's just take that doctrine, for example, of marriage. Now that's an institution that is under attack today. In America, where I live now, they've just legalized same-sex marriage. And, uh, and Christians, uh, Christian businesses are even being persecuted as a result of that. Well, have a look here. In Mark 10.6, Jesus was questioned about marriage, actually marriage and divorce. Notice his answer. He says, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, to become one flesh, and so on and so forth. The authority, the, the argument of authority for the basis of marriage was what the Creator had made. He says, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. God decided what the family unit was going to be. Here's another little quirky one for you, clothing. I notice you're all wearing clothing tonight, that's, that's good. Why? Well, you might say, because I want to look good or I want to, you know, it's cold or it's hot or whatever. But actually, you know, clothing was originally given for a moral reason in the Bible. Where was the first clothing given? When Adam and, and Eve sinned and God killed an animal to cover up their nakedness. In other words, they became self-aware and ashamed before God. So, you know, mums and dads, when you're having arguments with your teenage daughters and and sons about what they should wear, well, clothing should be worn in accordance with a moral basis. You know, even our seven-day week. So think about this. Science can tell us, for example, that, you know, the earth rotates with a light source on it and that gives us a day. And we have lunar cycles dominated by the moon and a solar cycle where the earth goes around the sun gives us our years. But what astronomical reason do we have for a seven-day week? There isn't one. In fact, it's a lasting historical memorial to the fact that God created in six days and rested for one. That's where it comes from. There you're reading from Exodus 20, verse 11. And the very gospel itself, the origin of sin and death into the world, which led to the gospel, you can read here in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Which scriptures? Well, the Old Testament, obviously. And that he was buried and rose again on the third day. By the way, science shows you men don't rise from the dead too, doesn't it? What are we, how are we going to rationalise that one away? See, some people would say miracles are unscientific. Actually, I'd argue another way. I'd say you can use science to show when a miracle has taken place. God is supernatural. He is above nature above the creation that he made he's not bound by the creation that he's made god does not live in our universe he interacts in it but he is beyond our universe so i just want to point out there this is what's at stake if we don't make a stand on the authority of scriptures starting in the book of genesis and the lord jesus here in mark 12 said love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul and of course, he's referring to the Old Testament, but he added a bit here and said, with all your mind. Brothers and sisters, you don't have to park your brains at the church doors on Sunday mornings. We have a reasonable faith. So I want to talk to you about some of these icons tonight. And this is one you've heard. No real scientist believes in evolution. What they really mean, uh, sorry, creation, what they really mean is most scientists believe in evolution, therefore evolution must be true, that's the corollary. Well, most scientists do believe in evolution, but as I said, for one simple reason, that's probably all they've ever heard, never heard a decent creation presentation. Do you know, on creation.com, we try to keep a list of you know, great scientists of the past who were deceased and living scientists. 
And we only list those uh, on, that have a PhD. So I'm just going to throw up a few of them here. Okay, this is, these are the PhD scientists that are listed on creation.com. And I want to point out these are the only ones who are brave enough to lift their head above the waterline because of the open discrimination against creationists, particularly in universities in the United States. Now you can see there's a few there. <laughs> now don't get me wrong, of course more scientists believe in evolution. But the idea that no real scientist believes in creation, some of those names there are great inventors like Dr. Raymond Damadian who, entered, who invented the MRI technology that saved countless lives. Dr. John Sanford, full Cornell professor who's invented the gene gun, the gene gun, the biolistic gene gun that is used for um, crop diversification and so on and so forth. World famous scientists, they, they don't have a problem with believing what the Bible says. So, you know, as I said earlier, it's not about the science. It's a worldview issue, a worldview issue, a belief system. What is a worldview, ladies and gentlemen? Let me just deal with that. A worldview is like a set of glasses or a filter or a framework which, once you reach the age of understanding, you use your worldview to interpret your world around you. Everything is interpreted through your worldview. And here's what I've learnt. What you believe about where you came from will ultimately determine what worldview you have. And I like to put it this way. I mentioned it on the radio here the other day. I, I, I could coin it down to those three big questions. You know the three big questions everybody talks about? You know, why are we here? Well, sorry, you know, where, sorry, let me start again. Where do we come from? Why are we here? What's the meaning and purpose of life? What happens to us when we die? Would you agree that anybody who can even think has probably thought about those three questions at some stage? That's why we call them the three big questions. Well, think about this. If evolution's true, is there any ultimate meaning and purpose to life except what you choose and decide? It really isn't, is there? We're just a giant cosmic accident. And by the way, what happens when you die under that scenario? Is there any life after death? They burn you up, put you in the ground, that's it. But if the Bible's true, if God really is creator, it says that you and I were created with meaning and purpose. And the decisions we make in this life, guess what? Well, they're going to affect where we spend the next life. But do you realise what I just did there? Because questions two and three will always be determined by what you think about number one. Number one is the foundational issue. It's the key to determining your worldview. So are you starting to see why I'm saying creation evolution is a foundation, a key battleground for the hearts and souls and the minds of people? All right, Gary, nice introduction. But you know, there's all this science out there that believes or supports evolution. And you and I are bombarded with this alleged evidence for evolution 24-7. But when I use the word science, what do most of you think about? Well, I think most of us, when we hear the word science, we think about technology. The type of technology that builds, you know, data projectors and laptop computers. Well, we would call that operational science. You know, where you can do an experiment, you see the results, you try to build upon that test. And, you know, that's how we develop technology over time. We get better and better at it. You know, I remember I got my first PC, I think back in 1993, my de desktop. It had a whopping 456 megabyte hard drive. Young people, I said megabyte, <laughs> not, hard, not gigabyte, all right? Now, think back, was I less intelligent 20 years ago? I don't think I was less intelligent. I think I've learned more, and that's how we develop technology. Now I mention that because of this idea that people lived in the past were somehow less intelligent because we feel they lived primitively. No, we just get better and better at improving things. We need time to do that. So you know, the type of science that builds you know, iPads and sends men to the moon is what we call operational or experimental science. That's different to trying to determine alleged events that happened in the past. Both creation and evolution are forms of historical science or origin science. Let's take a closer look at it. Operational science deals with experiments you can do in the present. You can repeat those experiments. You can observe the results. So here we are pretty much at sea level in Barbados. So when I boil water, what's it going to boil at? 100 degrees Celsius, right? I can do it tomorrow. The day after, I'll keep getting the same results. And when I boil water, I notice this liquid is, or this gas escaping. And I come up with an idea and I think, wow, maybe I can capture that gas, get a wheel, get some copper wires, next thing you've developed electricity, right? But what about the idea 
that birds evolved into dinosaurs 65 million years ago, or there was a Big Bang 14 billion years ago. These are evolutionists full of alleged events that happened one time in the past that were never observed. You can't repeat them. You c no one observed them. You can't test them. So in fact, is that science? As you and I commonly understand it. And by the way, don't say, well, evolution's just a theory. Because theory, in, in an academic sense, actually has good support. So guess, look, I just tested the theory of gravity. Evolution, ladies and gentlemen, my view is it's less than a scientific theory. It's a hypothesis, a belief system about the past. Now, just in case uh, somebody argues and says, well, that's just a creationist construct. That's not really used in science. Well, here's one of the world's most famous evolutionary scientists, Dr. E.O. Wilson from Harvard, biologist. And he says this, if a moving automobile were an organism, functional biology would explain how it is constructed and operates. That's experimental science. You get it? Taking it apart, looking at how it works. While evolutionary biology would reconstruct its origin and history and how it came to be made and its journey thus far. That's historical science. The only problem, can you actually do the second one? You can't. You can't reconstruct its history because you were not there in the past to see. We have data in the present. We have rocks and fossils. Both creationists and evolutionists, we've got the same facts. But we come to different conclusions about how they arose because of the set of glasses we wear our pre-belief that we bring to the facts. You know, what about the age of the Earth? That's the big hot ticket, isn't it? We're told the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. When I read the Bible, and you know that great bedtime reading that such and so and so on and so forth was such an age and he had a son and he was, got to such an age and he had a son. Uh, good bedtime reading that stuff. Well, it's all there to show us the Bible's real history. And in fact, in the New Testament, check out the book of Luke, you can trace, trace Jesus' ancestry. And you've got, you go back and you've got Solomon and David and, and Abraham, and they go all the way back to who? Adam. There to show us real people. Jesus was descended from a real, literal, historical person. You can't fit millions of years in Scripture. I'll talk about that later. But you say, but Gary, what about all these tests they do? You know, scientific tests. And of course, everybody throws up Carbon-14 dating, right? It's the one most people have heard of. Well, carbon-14 can't be used to test millions of years. The maximum life of any carbon-14 test is probably going to be around about 60,000 years. And you can only use it to date things that were once living. You can't use it on rocks, etc. Let me give you a brief explanation how carbon-14 is in the life cycle. So in the upper atmosphere, we have nitrogen-14, gets bombarded by atomic nuclei, gets converted to carbon-14. Carbon-14 gets taken in by the plants. Animals eat the plants. We eat the animals. The animal dies. The carbon-14 starts to decay. So it's in the life cycles, right? And it's being replenished all the time in living things. So the way radioactive dating works is all radioactive elements have a half-life. So they decay by half their original amount uh, in a set period of time. And in the case of carbon-14, it's 5,740 years. So, if I found a bone and I had 10 carbon-14 atoms in it, simplifying it, you might say, well, 5,740 years ago it must have had 20. And then 5,740 years before that it had 40 and so on. And it sounds reasonable, doesn't it? They can use it like a clock. But here's the problem. To arrive at a date of how old it is, you'd have to know how much was in it when it died, wouldn't you? I, I came up with this bath tab analogy, and all radiometric dating works this way, okay? Um, you know, uranium to lead is about every 500,000 years the half-life. But imagine you walked into a bathroom, and you saw a tap running filling the bathtub, right? And you think, well, I'm going to work out how long it took to fill the bathtub. So the first thing you do is measure the amount of water in the bathtub, and let's say there's 20 litres. That's like measuring the rate, amount of radioactive elements in your sample. And then I'm going to measure the flow rate of the tap. It's running at 2 litres per minute. That's like measuring the decay rate. So I'll ask you a question. 20 litres in the bathtub, 2 litres per minute, complicated maths. How long did it take to fill the bathtub? 
10 minutes? Sure. Not too hard? Well, I actually tricked you because you can't know how long it took to fill the bathtub. I said, imagine you walked into a bathroom and you found a tap running. You came in during the presently, currently operating processes. If you said 10 minutes, you made a whole bunch of assumptions. One of the assumptions you might have made is that the bathtub was empty when you started. Yeah, but maybe it was half full or half empty, depending you know, on what glasses you use to look at life, all right? Um, was any water added or removed during the process? Were you there in the past to determine that? No. Did the flow rate of the tap increase or did it slow down or did somebody turn it off altogether? All these events could have occurred in the past that you were not there to see and they would affect your assumptions, your decision on how long it took. You were not there in the past. In fact, that's kind of what you would call uniformitarianism. Have you heard that before? Uniformitarianism is the term that the present is the key to the past. We look at rates in the present, and I'm going to talk more about rocks and erosion, and we use that in the past. So for example, now I mentioned carbon-14, but there's also a stable element called carbon-12, and, and that one does not decay. So they measure the ratio between the two as well but you still have the problem with the decay rate. So uranium decays to lead, right? So you've got to then not only just try to work out um, how much of the daughter element, which is the lead was in at the beginning, but also the parent element. What was the starting amount? You've got to know that on both of them. Was any gained in the parent? Was any lost gained in the daughter? Was any lost in the parent? Was any lost in the daughter? And what about the rate? Did that remain constant? See all those assumptions you've got to make. It's not an exact science. I'm here to tell you that you can't prove the age of anything by any method of radioactive dating. It doesn't work like that. Now, remember I said carbon-14 has a relatively short half-life, right? Now, we're told that fossils take millions of years to slowly form. And so when you find things like coal or fossils that are deep in the rock layers that were told are hundreds of millions of years old, you should not find any carbon-14 in them. The amount would be negligible, it would be too small to measure. But guess what? A group of creationists got together a few years ago under what's called the RATE project, radioisotopes and the age of the earth, and they tested these things. All right, And these are from also from secular radiocarbon journals. Every single sample of wood, fossilised wood, coal, coal? I was taught that it formed in Carboniferous peat bogs 360 million years ago. Have you heard that? And yet it's got carbon-14 in it. How can that be? All fossils, everything ever tested, every one has carbon-14 in it. But you don't get to hear about that. Do you know what? They actually accused creationists of contaminating the samples. So they sent diamonds off for radiocarbon testing. Wow, diamonds. The hardest substance known to man. You know why? Because the lattice bonds are so strong, they're impervious to outside contamination. And, and diamonds, it's argued, are formed you know, deep in the bowels of the earth under lots of heat and pressure. They're supposed to be even up to billions of years old, ladies and gentlemen. But guess what? Every diamond sent off came back with carbon-14 in it. They cannot be billions of years old. And that's just one. There's helium diffusion and all sorts of technical things, etc. But just indicating to you that you don't have to be intimidated by these claims. So, you know what? We should be able to look at things that we know the age of and test radiometric dating. And this happened using something called the potassium argon method. Okay? Mount St. Helens in Washington State erupted in 1986 and they took some lava from the lava dome and it yielded ages of 350,000 years up to 2.8 million years for some rocks that basically were 30 years old. We have here Kilauea in Hawaii. Okay, a 200 year old recorded volcanic explosion yielded dates up to 22 million years. And Halulalai in Hawaii, which erupted in 1800, yielded dates of 160 million years up to 3.3 billion years of age for a volcanic eruption 200 years ago. So you can test 
the validity of radiometric dating. This is the big one, the geologic column. We've seen these pictures, they adorn you young ones here, you're going to get pictures like this in your natural science classes that these on the left hand side are epochs of time represented by rock strata and in the strata we typically find all of these rock layers etc. Well, the evidence to the best, and there's arguments about creationists over this, but you, you cannot find that geologic column in situ anywhere in the world. Now I would say there is a general order to the rocks and they overlap them to try to build what they think is a chronology of the age of the earth. But you know, you and I have all been told fossils are evidence for an ancient earth. Okay? And we're told that they take millions of years. Well, I'm going to show you a couple of things from secular journals here. Here's a fossilized octopus. And you can see the fossil on the left and their recreation on the right. By the way, that's exactly the same as octopus or octopi that are alive today. There's been no evolution. And the secular journal of paleontology said these things are 95 million years old, yet one of the fossils is almost indistinguishable from living species. Why do they think it's 95 years old? Well, the reason is usually the depth of the rock layers that they'll find it in. The deeper you go, the older the rocks and therefore older the fossils. What about this? By the way, when you see an octopus like that, um, slow, gradual, you know, fossilization or permineralization doesn't work. Can you see how it's wholly preserved? Doesn't that suggest it had to be buried quickly? Because think about what happens in the environment. I mean, you guys all live near the water. I mean, if a fish dies out there, it doesn't last very long, does it? What about this one? This is a, a fossilized um, ink sack from a squid. And what they did, you're seeing on the right hand side, is they withdrew and re reconstituted the ink and they're drawing with the ink from a fossil that's supposed to be 150 million years old. Now you hear these terms millions of years all the time, you just need to stop and think the incredible vast amounts of time they're talking about. I mean, try to think about what even one million years is in terms of our, our lifespan and our own knowledge of history. You see, when I went to school, this is a standard picture from my grade 11 biological science textbooks in Australia. And here's old Freddie Fish swimming along and he dies and he sinks to the ocean floor. Now notice while he's lying on the ocean floor, see these mountains? What's happened? They've disappeared. Suggesting a little bit of water, a little bit of erosion, sediments slowly come out and while the fish is lying on the ocean floor it gets permineralized and then the process starts again a few years later and you're capturing a record of history. That's what they believe the geologic column is about. But folks, under that process, how would you get fossils like that or that? You know, think about it. I said earlier, what happens when a fish dies out in the ocean? Does it sink to the bottom to start with? What happens? Usually floats, doesn't it? Don't believe me, boys and girls. Ask mum and dad if you can do the experimental scientific method at home tonight and put a teaspoon of cyanide in their goldfish bowl and find out whether Goldie sinks or floats when he dies, all right? So in the real world, it's going to be scavenged. It's not going to last very long. So what you need to get fully preserved fossils like that is a lot of mud and a lot of sediment in a short amount of time. You can bury the fish quickly in those layers and before long you can get a rapid fossil. Otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, how can you get things like fossilized jellyfish? Soft-bodied creatures. We have fossilized um, little sand eddies, wave eddies, fossilized raindrops, fossilized footprints. It's talking about rapid burial. Here's one from a, a mill in America, a fossilized sack of flour. <laughs> Heavy laden uh, mineral rich water permeated it. And what about this one from our creation magazine? Here you're looking at a, a lump of rock with a car inside it. So fossils can form quickly, rocks can form quickly under the right conditions. You see, most Christians here, I know you probably don't believe in evolution, but this age of the earth has been the thorny issue. And I mentioned it's the rock strata that they believe were laid down over eons and time. I'm going to use a picture of the Grand Canyon, because everyone's familiar with it. And can you see these coloured bands in the canyon wall? Those wide bands are called strata, and in the strata are very fine layers called sedimentary layers. 
And the idea is that, you know, wind or water washes those sediments in and maybe one thin layer per year and then the next year another layer. So when they look at the canyon wall with hundreds of millions of layers, they assume they're looking at hundreds of millions of years of Earth's history. Now who's heard stories like this? The Colorado River wound its way through the canyon and eroded it over tens of millions of years. Anybody heard stories like that? Actually, the reason I ask it, if we're honest, we've all heard stories like that, haven't we? Every one of us. And we look at the pictures and they say, see, evidence of deep time. Well, I'm going to show you now, and I always love to show this, this, this one event is what turned me from a long age believing evolutionist into a creationist. And I mentioned it earlier, Mount St. Helens. And you can watch videos on YouTube, there are documentaries you can watch. Mount St. Helens, there were many earthquakes going on, uh, and they knew the mountain was going to erupt because it was swelling. And you can see how it's venting at the top. But it didn't blow its top, look, it blew its side. One third of the volcano erupted and it blew lumps of rock as big as a city block over six miles, ten kilometres from the blast site. But ladies and gentlemen, this is just a baby when we consider some of the geologic events that have happened in Earth's history. And in the aftermath of the initial eruption, it laid down bands of strata. See those three separate bands? And there's a lady there for scale. But this middle section, we're going to have a closer look at that. It's full of these very fine laminations, the, the things that we're told take one per year. And you know, there's about seven metres in that, in that uh, central band there. Thousands of layers. Now, did it take thousands of years to lay them down? No, in fact, they were laid down precisely on June 12, 1980, in just three hours as a result of the catastrophic events of Mount St. Helens. Three hours. When you go back to Mount St. Helens now, there are canyons all over the place. And again, let's just do a self-check. How would you interpret that canyon formation? It's called Engineers Canyon. You can see the little river, the North Fork of the Toodle River running through it. You'd probably say, wow, that little river must have ebbed and flowed over long periods of time and slowly eroded the canyon. Fair comment? Well, the reason it's called Engineers Canyon is because Army Corps engineers diverted water from nearby Spirit Lake that was overfilling from the volcanic eruption and they sluiced it into this area and they eroded that canyon in just a few months. And don't think the material was soft and washed away. The floor of the canyon is solid basalt, that's hard volcanic rock. And you can see the striations, which is the scouring of the rock where it's been eroded by fast flowing mud and water. So you see, it's not a little bit of mud, a little bit of water, a little bit of sediment over a long period of time. It's a lot of mud, a lot of water, a lot of sediments over a short amount of time. It can do an incredible amount of geologic work. And by the way, if you could look at the screen and see my pointer there, see that side canyon? That's called, they called that Little Grand Canyon because it's a 140th scale of the Grand Canyon. And I'd love to tell you that one took a few months, but uh, actually that was formed in less than 24 hours as a result of the catastrophic events of Mount St. Helens. By the way, that's not the only event. There have been lots of other events. This canyon near uh, Washington, what happened? They had all these irrigation ditches and uh, they were all backed up with weeds and everything else and then they had heavy rainfall and it eventually let go. 80 cubic feet of water per second, which doesn't sound a lot, does it? But guess what it formed? It went from that to that. A canyon. Look at that, 500 foot by 120 feet deep. By the way, I'm a, a metres and kilometres guy because I come from Australia, but I live in America now, so I've had to go backwards, all right? So I apologise for all these being in uh, feet. And for all you Americans there, um, come on, get up with the real world. Okay. Other evidence. Here's one that's startling. And again, this is not creationist stuff. I'm not here kind of just making this up, ladies and gentlemen. This is in secular journals. Now, the, the age of the dinosaurs, according to evolution, was 300 to 65 million years ago. The last dinosaur roamed the Earth 65 million years ago. Right? But guess what? We're finding soft tissue in them all the time. Here, uh, Mary Schweitzer, at Montana State University, they found ligament and flesh and blood vessels and unfossilized red blood cells in a Tyrannosaurus rex leg bone. And they said, it's, when stretched, it returned to its original shape. It was still soft and stretchy. And she even said, when you think about it, the laws of chemistry and biology and everything that we know, what does she mean, the laws of chemistry and biology? Decay, 
degradation. It should be gone. But it isn't. And they found unfossilised dinosaur skin, and they've now even found unfossilised DNA in the bone cells of dinosaurs. DNA. That little chemical hard drive that's in the nucleus of the cells of every living creature. Very unstable molecule. And, you know, even using the same uniformitarian assumptions, I mean, we did that with radiometric dating, there are things we can use to test and invalidate the billions of years age of the Earth. So, the, through erosion, we roughly know how much salt is going into the ocean every year, about 450 million tonnes. And through evaporation and everything else, they're losing about 120 million tonnes per year. It gives us a maximum age of the ocean using the present processes that we see today of about 62 million years. Now, of course, we're not saying the oceans are 62 million years old, right? But that's the maximum age. It's not billions of years. By the way, if I put my worldview glasses on, does the Bible talk about an event that involved lots of water and lots of mud and lots of sediment in a short amount of time that you think could have formed most of the world's geology? Anybody know what I'm talking about? the great flood of Noah's time. And guess what? There would have been a lot of erosion during the flood, increasing the amount of salt in the ocean that we see today. The, the sea is not salty enough. Sea floor mud accumulates too fast. We know the amount of mud going in through uh, plate subduction. We know how much is, is, is being lost, etc. Okay? Sea floor mud has accumulated too fast. And the Earth's magnetic field is losing its energy too fast. Okay? The maximum age we can get, because it loses half of its energy every 1400 years, we believe there were rapid reversals of the Earth's magnetic field during the flood because we can look at those rock layers and we find, you know, uh, granules on the top that contain iron and they're aligned one way and in the very next layer at the, underneath they're aligned the other way. Shows there have been rapid reversals in the Earth's magnetic field. But the maximum age is 20,000 years for the Earth's magnetic field. By the way, if you want to take a note, I got that from an article on our website, creation.com, age slash, age of the Earth, put slashes in between there, dashes in between there. All right? 101 evidences for a young age of the Earth using presently operating processes to show you that the Earth cannot be that old. And by the way, all of this stuff I'm showing you here, and it was mentioned at the beginning, comes from our Creation magazine. And I'm going to pass some clipboards at the end of the meeting, give you an opportunity to do that. Because I'm only here for a couple of days. And you know what? I could talk for millions of years on this stuff, right? But I've only got one opportunity. So I want to leave you with something. And the magazine is the best way of keeping you up to date. Boys and girls, listen carefully to this one. Parents, this section here, this is the number one stumbling block for our young people going through higher education. Natural selection. Natural selection is real. It actually happens. But evolutionists say natural selection is the mechanism for evolution. You're going to hear comments like this, boys and girls. Your lecturers are going to say, we see creatures change over time, therefore evolution is true. We do see creatures change over time. But I'm going to show you it doesn't have the power to create anything new. See, when the lecturer says, I see evolution happening, it's a fact. He's talking about changes. What he's talking about are types of changes, you know, the difference between types of dogs and horses and butterflies. They might call that microevolution. What we generally think of and students think of is macroevolution, you know, uh, begonias to biologists type of stuff. Let's have a look at this. As I said earlier, all life is based upon information. That information is in the DNA molecule. Think about the DNA molecule in the nucleus of our cells like a hard drive. What are computer hard drives? They're a storage system and they contain lots of information codes to drive the computer. DNA is like that. It's an information code. It tells the cells what to build. It codes for repair systems that actually repair the DNA. By the way, if you don't realise that there's a chicken and egg problem because the instructions for the machines that repair the DNA are on the DNA, which came first, right? Okay. The DNA molecule has been described as the most complex information storage mechanism in the entire universe. In fact, if I could take a single strand of DNA out of any of the trillions of cells in our body, 
okay, and typed out the letters, because that's all they are, basically chemical letters, I could amass a pile of Bibles over 1,000 high in a single strand of your DNA. I want you to imagine this. Imagine a, a dressmaker's pin. If I could get a pinhead's worth of DNA and type out the letters of information, I could amass a pile of books that would reach to the moon 240 times. And the compression levels are incredible. So let's understand what evolution requires. They say that in a warm pond on Earth, a couple of billion years ago, the first amino acids formed to form the first protein, to form the first cell, and all life somehow generated from that cell. Well, the simplest living organism on the Earth today is a bacterium, and it has about half a million letters, about 580,000 letters. Okay? But to get from a bacterium to horses and human beings, you've got to add information. You've got to add letters of information. And they say that natural selection is the mechanism. Well, we're going to do a natural selection experiment or example, and we're going to use dogs. Everybody knows dogs, right? You've all got dogs. We've got Great Danes and Chihuahuas, and if you can call Chihuahuas dogs, but anyway. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so we start off here with a parent kind of dogs. By the way, Darwin thought dogs was a good evidence of evolution too. Now I want you to imagine they've got medium length fur. They're in the middle range of fur length that you can get with dogs. And the reason is, if you look in the tummy here, and this is a characterization, this guy here, he's got a gene. What's a gene? A gene is a set of instructions for short fur, and he's got a gene for long fur. And mum's got a gene for short fur and a gene for long fur. So they've got all the information necessary to produce differing fur lengths in their offspring. So these dogs get married, you know, they walk down the aisle and they have puppies. Now, what's happened here? This dog, this offspring's got short fur. It's different from the parent. Why? Well, you remember from your biology classes at school, we get one set of instructions from each of our parents, right? So, what happened is he inherited the short fur gene from dad and the short fur gene from mum. That was the set of instructions he got from both. You can get dogs in the medium range. Short fur gene from dad, long fur gene from mum. And this one might be the other way around. Long fur gene from mum, uh, dad, short fur gene from mum. Different combination of the genes, still expressed in the medium range. And then you get this critter, right? What happened there? So she only inherited the set of instructions for long fur from each of her parents. Have a look. There's change. Change in one generation. Okay? But here's the thing I want to ask you. Has anything new been created? No, they're still dogs, aren't they? Just a different type of dogs expressing different traits. Okay? Here's the next thing. When I say anything new been created, where did the information come from that they have? It had to come from pre-existing information that was already present in the population. Nothing new has been created. Okay? Different variation, but all had to come from pre-existing information. So let's imagine, you know, you can dump a, 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 a group of dogs ranging from short, medium to long fur, and let's put them in the frozen wilds of Alaska. Which ones would have a survival advantage in a cold climate? Long fur. So nature selects. Mm. Now nature is not some conscious living entity, right? It's natural selection is just a convenient term to describe that creatures without a favorable adaptation will get wiped out in certain environments. Selection. So the dogs with long fur survive better in cold climates. Okay, now what will happen when these ones reproduce? They'll only reproduce dogs with long fur. Why is that? Well, that's all that was available. And here is the third point. Well, let's recap the first two. Only information came from pre-existing information, all right? Nothing new is being created. Here's the third one. They've lost genetic information, haven't they? They've lost the genes for short and medium fur in the population. That is the opposite of what evolution requires. And the Bible doesn't use the term species, it uses kinds. Now species might be a situation where you keep breeding down and breeding down and breeding down to the extent where they've lost so much genetic information they will no longer breed with the parent population they come from. Or they might look so different that they call them different species. But species is a man-made term. So you could get a new species, but boys and girls, listen, there's nothing new being created. 
Don't fall for that one. Now, some of you, I presume you have dogs, right? You all own dogs. And you would know uh, with breeders, and they're trying to be breed pure breeds, which are actually degenerate mutts, because what happens that when you keep breeding too closely, you end up with birth defects and inbreeding problems. And I, I have a picture here. I don't know whether I should show it, Roger. It's very disturbing. But I've got a picture of an inbred dog. Do you want to see it? Oh, you gruesome lot. Okay. All right. So here's a picture of an inbred dog for you. All right. All right. By the way, natural selection is how you explain the question of where did the races come from? Where did the races come from? You know, my home country of Australia is only 200 years old. And, you know, when Captain Cook rediscovered it in 1788, he found mainly dark-skinned Aboriginal people living there. Well, Darwin's or origin of species only came out in 1859, and he even said... Uh, that he thought Australian Aboriginals might be the missing link. And you know, in my home country of Australia, European scientists and, in the, and from America, they went to Australia and they shot Aboriginal people to put them uh, on display or use them as specimens. Why? Because they thought they were less human, less evolved. Now, evolutionists get really upset when I use examples like that today because they say, we don't believe that today. No, not today because the science is caught up. But the Bible has always said that all people everywhere of one blood of one man, he made all nations of men. But see what happens is ladies and gentlemen, we notice the differences instead of the similarities. Think about all the similarities we have. You know, this is the most single most popular article we ever featured in Creation Magazine, the two-tone twins. You see one's supposedly white, one's supposedly black, as they say, and there are the parents, they're medium brown. You see, in fact, all people all over the earth have the same skin colour. It's a skin pigment called melanin. And, you know, I'm supposed to be a white person, but let me give you an example. I put up that piece of paper. Is my skin white? <laughs> see, I'm light brown. Most of you here are dark brown. Some of you are medium brown. And you know what? Melanin... A skin pigment, our DNA codes for it. If you have a lot of it, it's a natural sunscreen. In Australia, where I'm from, we have the highest rates of skin cancer in the world. Very hot climate. So when people would have moved around the world into these new environments, the post-flood world, the, the, the new continents that were formed, you know, you'd have had a fair skin people, medium brown skin people, dark brown skin people move to somewhere like Australia. But guess what? We, we didn't know about skin cancer, right? So... Fair-skinned people like me, we get skin cancers, we die, we don't pass our genes on to the next generation. That's why you find typically dark-skinned people living in hot climates. By the way, if you're dark-skinned and you live in climates where you don't get a lot of sun, suffer vitamin D deficiency. That's a problem as well. So they're medium brown. DNA codes for your eye, sh eye shade, hair shade, and skin shade, not color, because we've all got the same color. And by the way, if you've got blue eyes, um, they're actually not coloured blue. It's a distinct lack of melanin that gives the impression that they're actually blue with the light refracting black, uh, back through it. My wife, she's a natural blonde. She's a, what we call an Aussie Sheila, right? Blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin. I've got four adult children. Uh, I didn't get a look in in the gene selection there because they all came out with blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin, just like their mother. <laughs> So they don't have a lot of melanin. So just imagine if you're a natural blonde, blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin, and you married somebody else that had blonde hair, blue eyed, fair skin, and then say they married somebody that had blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin, and if that's all you kept doing, you'd only ever produce blonde hair, blue eyed, fair skinned people, which actually does make the point that blondes really do have less information. <laughs> I mean, genetic information, sorry. Um, genetic information, okay. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, 70% of the world's population today, 70% has medium brown skin, medium brown hair, medium brown eyes. I believe Adam and Eve must have been in that medium range and in one generation they could have produced lighter offspring and darker offspring. Okay? And guess what? Study of modern genetics, which Darwin knew nothing about. Okay? Modern genetics is like information technology today. They talk about you know, gigabytes of information in the cell. 
We now know you could fit all of the variation of humanity on this planet with an original single couple. The Bible said it all along. See, and we have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, we, we might not have, as Bible-believing Christians, we might not have the science understanding today. But I tell you what, the Bible's never been falsified on that basis. You should hang tough on it. Well, could God have used evolution to create? In America, there's an organization called Biologos, and they're headed by a very famous scientist. His name is Francis Collins. He was the former head of the Human Genome Project, and President Obama made him the director of the National Institutes of Health. Uh, this group are what we call theistic evolutionists. They believe that God used evolution. And uh, I have a couple of quotes here. Here's one by Francis Collins. And he says, many still wonder why the macroevolutionary changes, the macroevolution, these are the, the, you know, the big changes, have never been observed. So first see the admission, we've never observed it. Is it science? No. Have never been observed. The simple answer, we haven't been watching long enough. The types of genetic information that eventually lead to the macroevolutionary changes, the big changes, are rare, and this accounts for the slow pace of evolutionary development. The amount of time we've been observing nature is only a tiny fraction of the evolutionary time scale. We don't see it. It happened in the past over a long period of time. I'm sorry, that's not science. That's a belief system. But here's the problem. Because, and I'm not saying he's not a Christian, don't get me wrong, but is the Bible his authority? Okay. Here's a staff writer from Biologos on their website called Kenton Sparks. Here's where it ultimately leads. Because as I said, you can't get millions of years in the Bible. The Bible doesn't talk about a Big Bang 14 billion years ago. If you've got to try to fit it in somewhere, you're ultimately going to be on that slippery slope of unbelief where you just reject God's word and you just make up a Christian faith in accordance with your belief system, which is evolution. So Kenton Sparks says this, listen carefully. If Jesus, as a finite human being, erred from time to time, hello? There is no reason at all to suppose that Moses, Paul, John wrote scripture without error. Rather, we are wise, wise, okay, to assume that the biblical authors express themselves as human beings writing from the perspectives of their own broken finite horizons. I've had conversations with these guys. Well, Jesus didn't understand science. Um, Colossians 1. He was before all things. He made all things. He upholds all things. You know, normally I'm not this strong. But ladies and gentlemen, I say this because I have one opportunity to convince you. Don't fall for this evolutionary lie. That's not Christianity. Everything you and I understand, our knowledge about the Christian faith, comes from the Bible. That's it. Remember I started off saying, if you can't trust the first book, where does it begin? What do you do with passages like this? Because that guy would have to throw that one out, wouldn't he? That all scripture is God-breathed, inspired by God. And here's the other thing. You know, arguably the world's most famous evolutionist today is Professor Richard Dawkins. Some of you heard of him? former professor for the understanding of science at Oxford. He, he was raised in the Methodist church and he said the reason he left the faith was because of evolution. So he was interviewed on this Christian TV channel called Revelation TV. I've been on there twice in the UK. And the interviewer, Howard Condor, said, was there a particular point or something that you read or an experience that sort of said, yeah, this is it, God doesn't exist? And he said, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way, seeing evolution as the enemy. Whereas the more, what shall we say, sophisticated theologians are quite happy to live with evolution, I think they're deluded. Not my words, I'm not trying to be offensive. That's the world's leading atheistic evolutionist. He says to us Christians, if you try to add evolution to the Bible, you don't believe what you believe, you're deluded. That's what the world is. So who are we trying to win? You, try, you win them over by compromising? No. Jesus says they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. He said, I think the evangelicals have got it right in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity. I realize that about the age 16. 
Do you know, when I first became a Christian, as I said, I was an evolutionist, and I, I went through all these mechanisms to try to fit evolution in the millions of years in Scripture. I said, well, there couldn't have been a local flood, a global flood. You know, we don't see global floods, so maybe it was a local flood, you know. But think about it. Noah built this massive ship. The dimensions are in the Bible. You know, over 300 metres long, 20 metres high, over about 70 to 100 years. I mean, why did he take all that time, go to all that trouble to build a giant ship to escape a local flood? I mean, he could have packed a suitcase and walked off to another country in that time, couldn't he? <laughs> why were birds on the ark if the flood was local? Remember, Noah let out a dove at the end. Theistic evolution, the idea that God used evolution, kind of lit the fuse of the Big Bang and took his hands off the wheel. That's what a ministry headed by a group uh, uh, by Dr. Hugh Ross called Reasons to Believe. We call them progressive creationists. He believes in a Big Bang billions of years ago and soulless ape men before Adam. And again, not to disparage, but be careful when someone calls themselves a creationist. Because, you know, when I went to school, I was told the Big Bang was about five billion years ago. And then through high school and college, it was, you know, 10 billion years and 15 billion years, and it even went up to 20, and now we're back to 13.7 billion years. Here's the lesson. If you'd have hung your biblical interpretation upon the science of the day, guess what? You'd have to change it tomorrow. And then you have to change it again. And you know the fundamental problem with that, ladies and gentlemen? How do you know what truth is? If truth is dependent upon some scientific interpretation, you can't even trust what you're reading today. Well, I'm going to reserve judgment because tomorrow they're going to find out something different. Science is like that. We're going to discover something tomorrow we didn't know today. We don't know everything there is to know about everything. Uh, there is someone who does that. The framework hypothesis. You know, if you're off to Bible college or seminary, this is the most popular view in colleges today, that Genesis is not real, literal history, kind of a poetic framework of truth so we can understand the nature of God and our need for salvation. The gap theory. Let me deal with this one. Really popular. Genesis 1.1, right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then what happens is they inserted a big gap of time between verse 1 and verse 2. Verse 2 onwards talks about the filling of God's creation. Why do you, this came from the Schofield Study Bible, by the way. They did the rounds in the 50s and the 60s. Why did they do that? Well, they believed that the rock layers with the fossils was evidence of deep time on earth. Right? So they inserted that time, deep pack, that, that period of time in there. But there's a problem. Because, as I said, the rock layers are fossils. Okay? But Genesis flood didn't occur till chapter 6. So they came up with something called Lucifer's flood to explain all the rocks and the fossils. Mm. Can anyone give me chapter and verse where I'd find Lucifer's flood mentioned in Scripture? Anybody? Give me that one. In fact, could anyone give me a passage where I'd see the term millions of years or billions of years in Scripture? Lesson, do you get that idea from the Bible? No. It's an outside idea, a secular, what do I mean by secular? Non-Christian interpretation of the data, the rocks and the fossils. And then we take that and we try to shoehorn that into God's word to tell us what he means. Well, the correct test, the hermeneutical principle is to test scripture with scripture, right? So let's do that. We go to Exodus 20, 20, 11. I mentioned it before. In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Verse 1, 1 of Genesis. Any full stop there? Any gap? and the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day, the heavens and earth, and everything in six 24-hour days. By the way, how do I know the 24-hour days? Ladies and gentlemen, that is one of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, inscribed by the finger of God in tablets of stone. Hmm. Think about some of those other commandments. Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal. And we got a problem with any of those other ones? No. And here God inscribed in his word for us, the six days of creation. The day-age theory, this is the one that I subscribe to, you know, that a day in the Lord is like a thousand years. You ever tried that, 2 Peter 3, 8? It says a thousand years are like a day, so it kind of cancels itself out. But the context of that passage is that it's talking about the patience of God, not creation. The day-age theory is, could the days in Genesis be millions or billions of years each? Well, Dr. Hugh Ross here, he says the word day in English and in Hebrew, which is yom, he says it can mean an indefinite period of time. And he's actually correct. But we always understand the meaning of words from the context they use there. Let me give you an example of how I can change the context of the word day. 
You know, if I said to you it took me three days to fly from Brisbane, Australia to, you know, uh, Barbados, how many 24 hour days have I spoken about? Someone quick. Three, thank you. The reason I wanted you to do it quickly is because I didn't want you to think about it. I didn't want, to, didn't want to have time to think about it. Because you understood the context automatically when I put a number in front of the word day. Three days. And if I said, hey, it's great to be here with you this, uh, this evening, you know, the evening I'm talking about, the part of a day, and, and, and you know, I'm going to have to get up at like 4.30 a.m. in the morning to do a radio interview. So, you know, the evening and the mornings I'm talking about are parts of a 24-hour day. So let me totally change the context on you now. I want to tell you a story about something that happened in my father's day. Can you tell me how many 24-hour days I'm talking about now? See how I changed it? Okay, so we realise that. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and find out what the context is. Verse 5, God called the light day, darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning, there was one day. Three definers of the context. We go on, there was evening, there was morning, there was a second day. You know what's coming next? There's evening, there's morning, there's a third day. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to see a pattern here, I think. You know, there's evening, there's morning, there's a fourth day. Am I driving you nuts yet? There's evening, there's morning, there's a fifth day. I think God might be trying to tell us something. There's evening, there's morning, there's a sixth day. But I didn't write it. If God wanted to define to you six 24-hour days, ladies and gentlemen, could he have made it any clearer? You know, and we look up in the sky, and I'm going to talk about this when I talk about my UFO talk. I'm going to talk about the Big Bang and the size of the universe and the amount of stars. You know, we have hundreds of billions of galaxies like our Milky Way. Our Milky Way maybe has 200 billion stars in it. And then we've got hundreds of billions of galaxies all containing hundreds of billions of stars. And the Bible says God determines their number and he calls them each by name. And we're quite happy to look up and go, wow, God, you made all that. But you know what? You couldn't have done it in six 24-hour days. And outside of Genesis 1, the word yom, Day plus number, 410 times it appears in the Old Testament. Evening and morning without the word day, or evening and morning with the word day, night with the word day, 523 times it appears. And guess what? It always means an ordinary day. No one ever questions the meaning of Yom outside of Genesis 1. Yeah, but it couldn't have meant 24-hour days because scientists have shown us the world is billions of years old. No, they don't. They just interpret geology incorrectly. That's about it. A geologic column. Well, as I said, we do see a general order to the rocks. I don't have time to talk about it now, but I believe it's an order of burial from the flood. The flood started in the deep oceans. 98% of the fossil record are creatures that live on the ocean floor. It's not an equal representation like you see there. Less than 2% of the fossil record are vertebrates, typically creatures that live on the land, for example. But here's the theological problem, ladies and gentlemen. You know, on day six of creation, God's about to rest from his work and he says he looked down and saw all that he had made and it was very good. If those rock layers around the world are really a record of death and suffering and pain and disease over millions of years, Adam and Eve would have been standing on a fossil graveyard beneath them. And God says that's very good. Anybody think death is good? Death stinks, doesn't it? You know, the Bible, the New Testament, one of those New Testament passages referring back to Genesis says, a sin entered the world through one man, death through sin. In this way, death came to all men because all sin. It's our fault. See, here we are on this mud ball spinning in space. Bad things happen. And we're going to die. But God, the Creator, if he is the creator in Genesis, guess what? He says he's going to make a new heavens and earth where righteousness dwells. And you know, you may have been sitting here tonight, maybe you're not a Christian and you're listening to the creative, crazy creationist at the front. But I only mention that to, because what's at stake here? What's at stake? Eternal future. And the only people that are inheriting that are the ones that recognize that God himself that incredible creator stepped out of heaven to become one of us, to pay the penalty of death that was due you and I for messing up his creation. Now listen, I'm no greenie, but this is God's planet. And we messed it up. 
And we're living with the consequences of that. But even though we messed up God's creation, he sent a rescue mission out of heaven to pay the penalty that was due you and I. And people want to know if God's a God of love. See, that's called grace. That's a Christian term, but it means unmerited favour. In other words, we got what we didn't deserve. God is a God of love. And he made a way for you to be reconciled back for him. Should we take Genesis literally? If Genesis is not real literal history with a literal good creation, with a literal Adam and Eve, and if sin did not literally enter the world through their actions, then ladies and gentlemen, then you and I don't literally need to be saved from anything. That's it. It's pretty simple, isn't it? But we overcomplicate things. Now in a moment, we're going to have a break. This is the first question. And we, we've deliberately chosen not to ask you what your names are. So, if God is perfect in all ways, how did his own perfect creation have a problem? Hmm. There's a second one, because you want to ask that first. And then. Okay, what's the second part? Why don't dinosaurs go on their... Ark. Sorry, why didn't the, the, sorry, why didn't the dinosaurs go on the ark? Okay. And if they did, why have they become extinct? Okay. So the issue is, it's the problem of evil question. And here, I have to be careful because I could jump into, you know, Calvinism versus Arminianism. If you don't know what that is, that's good. I'm not going to tell you. If you do, forgive me. I'm not trying to go there. All right? Uh, so if God is good, why is there a problem? Ultimately, there's, there's two things I think we have to look at, is relationship. God wants... He created us in his image to have a relationship with him. Okay? And he gave mankind a choice. Everything was provided for mankind, but mankind in his sin said, Yeah, God, I see what you did. I mean, God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, Eve, Eve Adam and Eve, but they still chose to do what they wanted to do. And then that brings the question then, well, if God knew they were going to sin, you know, why didn't he do something different, rub it out, start again. There's all sorts of permutations you can look at. But I think one of the problems is when we look at this question, you and I think in a linear fashion. Do you know what I mean by linear? See, we live in time. When God created the heavens and the earth, that's when time began. And our measurement of framework for time is the earth. I said the earth rotates, the sun's there, we define a day. If you live somewhere else in the solar system on Jupiter, a day is different length. But here's the thing, God describes himself as the I am that I am, the beginning and the end. Does he exist in time? He is a timeless being. So we have to be careful of rationalizing and thinking about sequences of, event, of events, about why did God do this or he could have done this in a sequence of time. Because you and I live in a linear existence where there's a today, a tomorrow and a past. Now, how God sees our existence, I honestly don't know. How, do, how do, can I even conceive timelessness? But the reason I know he's a timeless God is it says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It means that God must have been there before the heavens and the earth. If When he created the heavens and the earth, time began, right? There was no matter, there was no space, not even the first Adam. There was God. He is a timeless being. So in God's wisdom, which is no time to him, he still chose to create. He obviously knew it was going to go wrong, but God is sovereign. Okay, He will ultimately have his way. And those of us who have been redeemed by his grace will inherit an eternal life with him. And now here's another thing. I think that eternity to come okay, of our existence there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. There's going to be physical planets. How time will be measured, I do not know. But if I'm going to be singing worship songs to God, I'm going to be counting, right? One, two, three, four. We count, time exists, etc. So, you know, I think that, hopefully that answers the question because I think a lot of those questions come about why did God do this, etc. We're rationalising it from our own linear thought processes where God is above it all. And uh, obviously, he sees time like, uh, like we have, but I don't 
presume that he lives in time. Dinosaurs. Why were dinosaurs not on the ark? Who before, said you, before you continue, let me just ask this question because I think it's related to that one. As okay. Well. Um, the person also asks, which animals did not go into the ark? So you can make the two. Okay. Well, it's pretty clear all the air breathing land animals went on the ark. Two of some, a two of every kind, and seven of some. That doesn't mean, and you could probably exclude types of insects. Insects do not breathe the same way that we do. They aspirate through their, uh, through their skeletons, etc. It doesn't necessarily mean that all the fish survived. So you could have had lots of fish go extinct. But two of every air-breathing land animal must have gone on the ark. Now, here's the issue. Uh, we have, I mentioned the word species through natural selection. So I'm going to pop up my slides here so you can see. So we have different species of animals today. So let me give you an example. So a lion and tigers are separate species. That's the terminology that they've given them, but lions and tigers can interbreed, which shows they came from a created kind. Camels and llamas can interbreed. Killer whales and dolphins have interbred in captivity. They look different, but just like you know, Great Danes and, whoops, as I said there, and Chihuahuas are different. Have a look at them, different bone structures, different body shapes, etc. So there would have been representatives of those kinds uh, on the ark. What they originally looked like, I don't know. We've got these modern varieties. Zebras are a type of horse. Uh, what the original kinds were like, we can't actually uh, be sure. And one of the other problems is that when we look at the fossil record, and there were originally, they named about 200 species of dinosaurs. But they've now realised that what they've done is they were giving species name to the same dinosaurs at different stages of growth. So, for example, you've got Dracorex, the Gimeloc, Pachycephalosaurus are actually the same dinosaur. In fact, it was a problem for evolutionists because they said, how come we don't find any juvenile dinosaur fossils? Well, they did. But they named them wrongly, that was the problem. And you can actually watch a TED talk from Jack Horner, the world's leading dinosaur paleontologist. He actually talks about this. So dinosaurs were on the ark. How? Well, first off, the ark was massive, as I said earlier, three decks, okay? And most of us think about dinosaurs, we think about those huge, large creatures, but not all the dinosaurs uh, were, in fact, large. Some dinosaurs were as small as a chicken. Okay? In fact, uh, you've got Compsognathus, he's about a chicken sized dinosaur. And when we look at the fossils of dinosaurs, it looks like the average size was probably about the size of a small horse or pony. That was the mean size. Some were as small as a chicken, some grew to be huge, like Brachiosaurus, which is, you know, 20 meters long. And I remember my first creation meeting, I said, you know, could the flood account for the extinction of the dinosaurs? And the guy said, no, the dinosaurs are on the ark. I thought my head was going to explode. And he said, well, remember, even those great big dinosaurs all started off as eggs. They were all originally once small. Now, Noah did not necessarily take eggs on the ark. The purpose of preserving animals on the ark was to reproduce. So the animals had to be of, if you like, childbearing age. And guess what? Reptiles today are sexually mature, can reproduce before they are fully grown, uh, just like humans. So Noah could have taken teenage dinosaurs on the ark, capable of reproducing after the flood. He didn't have to take 60-foot Apatosaurus. And there's a, another one. The question was a little loaded, because it says, um, you know, did they go extinct? Why don't we see them today? And in fact, there's a black book out there. Okay, um, let me see if I can find it for you. Uh, which has lots and lots of pictures clearly where humans have seen dinosaurs. So, for example, there is a Chinese jade dragon, which looks exactly like a protoceratops. A 16th century French tapestry features a duck-billed dinosaur called a Maezura, and we've got the right number of toes, the earlobes, and everything here. One we featured in Creation magazine in Cambodia in the Angkor Wat temple, you're looking at engravings uh, sculptured into the limestone there. At the top, we've got a human. Um, we've got an antelope next one down. Uh, at the bottom, we've got an iguana. But see that one there? Anyone recognize what that is? Stegosaurus. Okay. And those 
those engravings are about 800 years old. Bishop Bell, buried in Carlisle Cathedral, 1496 in the north of England. There are brass inlays around his tomb. And when we look at the creatures, we can see a bat, a fish, a dog wearing a collar, <laughs> a bird. And then we have these two necking dinosaurs. And one on the right doesn't have a split and any spikes on his tail. He's a sauropod of some description. But the one on the left, look, you've probably never heard of a Shunosaurus, but he's the only one that has that cleft and the two spikes on his tail. A Mesopotamian cylinder seal with this long spindly neck dinosaur called Tanistrophius. So humans and dinosaurs have coexisted, which means they were survived the flood. All right, now they, we don't see them today. I personally think they are extinct, but animals go extinct all the time because we kill them. And, you know, reproduce or repopulating the world after the flood, all the vegetation had to regrow. It's quite possible dinosaurs started predating on humans, but I think it was probably more the other way around because a nice triceratops could feed your family for a month. And you don't know if he's the last one on Earth. There were no TV cameras in the corner of the planet in those days, and you wouldn't care if he's the last one on the Earth if hunger and survival is your most basic need. There's a book out there, Dinosaurs, uh, featured in Dire Dragons. If there's one open, you can have a look. There are literally dozens and dozens of examples uh, like that as well. All right. Okay. All right, this person is asking, how do you account for Barbados's... Um Barbados coral formation. Well, I wish my, I wish my marine biologist, Dr. Robert Carter, was here because he's done about 700 dives, including in the Caribbean, uh, and he would tell you. I don't know about your coral reefs uh, or what, you're, what you've been told about them. I'm sorry I don't have that local knowledge, but I presume you've been told they've been formed over hundreds of thousands of years, correct? Okay. Well, in Australia, they say the same thing about the barrier reef. And the fact is, is that we know it can form much quicker. Again, it's the same, it's the same old story. Um, you know, it's like looking at ice cores. We're told that, you know, that we look at ice cores and we have 200,000 ice cores, but we know that we can get more than one ice core per year as well. The same way the rock layers, we're told one per year. We know that we can get multiple layers depending upon certain events. And there's also a lot to do with the post-flood world and environment as well. And there's different views amongst creationists how that would have possibly caused accelerated growth of coral reefs uh, and so on and so forth. So unfortunately, I, I can't answer that. I don't ever pretend to know anything that I don't because I'm not familiar with your reefs. But you can just type in on creation.com, whoever asked the question, coral reef formation. There's a lot of information, layperson and technical, and um, as I said, one of my scientists in the Atlanta office is Dr. Robert Carter, who is a marine biologist. So it's actually his specialty. So he can answer that one for you. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next one. Um, were the ages of person recorded in, in Genesis, um, those who lived 900 years plus, were those literally 365 years? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I showed you the study of genetics and natural selection before. Uh, there is something known as genetic entropy. This is a real phenomenon, and it means that our genes, our genome is decaying, okay? So let me put it this way. You know, when I said we get one set of instructions from each of our parents, well, we inherit through the sexual reproduction cells about 50% of their mutations. A mutation is a copying mistake. So imagine I had a nice printed sheet of paper, and I went onto the photocopy here and I photocopied it and it destroyed one letter. And then I take that, that copy and then I go and copy it again. Now I've got a bad copy of a bad copy. Every time our cells reproduce, we add mutations, letter mistakes, copying mistakes in the genome. So I inherited about 50% of all of my parents' mutations, plus I added a minimum, a minimum of about a hundred letter mistakes of my own. So the reality is each generation of humans is getting more multiply mutant. But the reverse of that means as you go further back, human beings were actually genetically more fit in the past. Now you'd already be aware that in society we're having problems with 
allergic reactions to medicines and we're getting increase in birth defects, etc., because the human genome is rusting out. There, in fact, it's, we see it in every organism. Dr. John Sanford, who I mentioned before, a molecular biologist, um, you know, he's a pioneer in this type of research. So here's the issue. Kind of if we looked at the rate of human genome decay, and if Homo sapiens had supposedly been around for 200,000 years, we, we would be basically mutated out of existence already. So it fits the biblical time frame. It also means when we go back, right, all the way back to Adam and Eve, who would have lived eternally except God brought a curse, and obviously he could have switched on some mechanisms in the genes, shortened their days, but even from then, the lifespans obviously start to decay. But then we have a very significant event, Noah's flood. So think about it, pre-flood, you've got these long ages of the patriarchs, but all humanity now gets genetically bottlenecked through eight people on the ark, right? Noah lived for 300 plus years after the flood. So some people, creationists, have said, well, the environment changed, but the environment couldn't have been really too toxic after the flood because Noah lived for 300 years. But his descendants, their lifespan start to decay rapidly. Because guess what? You had all this diversity in, in the genome available in the populations before the flood, but you've now got a genetic bottleneck. And here's something else we've discovered recently. Noah was about 600 years old before he had children. So if you said the lifespans were 900 years, 60, 600 years, he was two thirds of his lifespan potentially through before he had children. And we now know that older parents, we actually pass more aged DNA onto our offspring because of the amount of mutations we've built up. Okay? So not only did we have the genetic bottleneck, we also had the added factor that Noah was quite old when he had children. So that's why after the flood you see the lifespans decay. But going backwards, less genetic mutations, which means it's why people could have lived long ages before the flood. Many years ago, people thought it was more environment. And that's the reason I gave you that long explanation, is to point out Noah lived a long time after the flood. So there was no probably great environmental change or anything like that. The answer is in genetics. Okay, the next question is, is it possible that God used the languages at the Tower of Babel to divide us into groups called races? Uh, yes, absolutely, and I think there's been subdivision uh, since then. Um, you guys speak English, but if you don't speak very slowly, it doesn't sound like English to me, right? Because you have a particular dialect in the way that you speak and you end up using terms and phrases. Uh, I love Singapore, and my friends in Singapore speak a, a dialect of English called Singlish, okay? Um, in fact, we have a talk on our website. Uh, it's, uh, it's a DVD download you can get, and it's by a linguist, uh, Professor Alan Steele. And I think from memory, and don't quote me, but I think he traced all varieties of language back to, I think, no more than eight groups which could have been the Tower of Babel event, you see. Now, we obviously have more languages than that today, but a lot of the languages we have are variants of each other. You know, Spanish and French obviously came from the same language family. We see similarities in them, etc. So in terms of races, okay, uh, also, yes, because when you separate... Well, let me go back a step. We, most of you parents here, you have children, right? And you look at your children, you can say, well, he's got my nose and, and, and you know, he's, uh, he's got the wife's eyes or something. So you see the little genetic traits passed on. So you can see what isolation in a group does. So when you divide people based upon language or anything, what happens is your genetic traits start to become dominant features in the population. So take Western Europe, predominantly white. And, but there are political boundaries. They're very small countries, but they drew up political borders. But even in places like Europe, like if you go to Yugoslavia, you'll see Slavic people have dominant, you might call, racial features that look different to people, say, who live in England or France and, and so on and so forth. So, yes, through separation, genetic traits can become uh, inbuilt, if you like, and dominant in the population. 
And by the way, can I say, just I actually don't like using the word race. I honestly don't. Because the Bible doesn't use the word race. As soon as you invoke the word race, I think, to be honest, it has an evolutionary connotation to it. Uh, there's one race, and genetics shows that, the human race, that's it. Now, you, race you could use to describe cultures, but I just, I just think the whole word race is, to be, to, to, is loaded to me, you know? Uh, I think the more, and when you think about it, when you talk about race, it, it creates a separation, right? And whereas, you know, if the Bible's true, as I said, all of us here are descended from an original man and woman, right? We're all actually closely related, believe it or not. So, and I, and I think the Bible is the only answer to racism. Because you think about it, you know, we, we deal with these issues in the United States, we've had our own country in Australia, and regardless of what it is, you can't impose morality on a heart that's not willing to accept it. You can change laws, right? But unless you change a person's heart, you're not going to change it. I, I'm, I live in Atlanta in the deep south, and I can tell you, it's still, racism is still an issue there because it was culturally the way, even within the church, the way that people were brought up. And people still identify and see, see each other differently. We have black churches and we have white churches, and it was totally foreign to me coming from Australia. You know, So why, why do people still do that? Because they see themselves as a separate race. That's why I have a problem uh, with that word. Sorry, I got on my soapbox there, but anyway. Right, I'm going to paraphrase this question. I think the person is asking about the missing links. Do you want me to take that? Because yes. it's not so much a question. I think the person wanted to make a statement but on this. So given at each stage of supposed evolution from ape men, okay, we're talking about these intermediates, there should be millions of fossils of the stages in between. Yes, there should. But remember what Francis Collins said. You also have to understand how an evolutionist thinks. They believe the process of fossilization in the past is extremely rare and that evolution is very, very slow. So you're only going to see very, very small changes. And the other thing with most of the human fossils we find, you see these classic textbook representations, but the fact is we don't find that. Most often we find fragments of jaws and, or a tooth, and then you see these magnificent pictures uh, built up from them. In fact, I think the TV series Walking with Cavemen a few years ago, Robert Winston was driving his four-wheel drive and he went around to the back and he opened a big box and he said, this is, in this box I could fit the sum total collection of all of the human fossils that we've ever found. And yet you have the nice lineages. Now that nice lineage that I had when I went to school with Java Man and Peking Man, they're all in the trash can now. They're all gone. And you only really have to wait a few years for some new candidate to come up. So it's a very, very fluid uh, process. One of the big issues, and there's a chapter in the Answers book on this, is where are all the human fossils? Even for Homo sapiens, been around for 200,000 years. We should have billions of graves, and, uh, and we don't find those as well. The other question here was really about male and female, that we have complementary reproductive systems that are different to each other. Absolutely. Sex, the origin of sex, the evolutionary origin of sex, is a huge problem because we apparently came from an individual, single-celled creature originally. It's, it's a huge problem. I want to show you something here because remember I said natural selection? Now, this is the other one that they add to. It's called mutation. So natural selection plus mutation. So copying mistakes could possibly give rise to, um, to these so-called changes. So you could get a mutation that causes, uh, you know, over time, a complementary sexual reproductive reproductive organ in an opposite species. But I'm going to use this example. Remember, mutations are actually copying mistakes. So it's pretty rare that you copy a precise machine like the human genome, put mistakes in it and things get better. Now don't argue that you know, there are no beneficial mutations. It's something creationists used to say years ago. We don't say that anymore because you could. You know, let's say if you're a sheep wandering in the Australian outback, uh, or, or you're in a, 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 a station, a farm in the Australian outback, and you were born with five legs instead of four. Well, you can't jump over the fence now, and so the dingoes can't get you and select you out, and so on and so forth. Of course, if that sheep was in the wild, he's going to be selected out because he's less fit. So in certain circumstances, you could get a mutation for blindness. And we have blind cave fish in Australia because being blind 
in a very, very dark cave might be an advantage over sighted fish. Sighted fish might you know, bump the walls and get scratches in their eyes or infections. But here's what has to happen, because this also has to happen for reproductive organs for sex. Imagine a population of 100,000 apes 10 million years ago. Now we're supposed to have evolved from apes about 2 million years ago. Okay, so we're being very generous. We've increased it fivefold. You actually need to fix a mutation in the population. You need the same beneficial mutation in a pair for it to become fixed, to become dominant. Otherwise, it just gets selected out. So let's say a generation of apes is 20 years. Okay, after 10 million years, you'd only have 500, 000, you'd have 500,000 generations go by. So you're now fixing. 500,000 beneficial mutations, that equates to less than 0.02 of the human genome. So you all heard that we're 98% similar to chimps and that's not true. In fact, that's a 62% is a 60 million letter difference. 60 million letter difference. And in 10 million years, you can't even fix a fraction of that. And by the way, we're actually only around about 60% genetically similar to chimps now. Because guess what? We find out and we learn more about the DNA, etc. So yes, so complementary reproductive organs, it's the same problem. You'd have to have something born with the same beneficial mutation to have it fixed. And then, of course, you're only talking about one mutation, not a whole reproductive system in the opposite sex. Uh, and again, go to creation.com, type in evolution of sex on the website, and there's lots and lots of articles about it. Okay, this person is asking about unicorns. You know, we, we hear a lot about unicorns. Yeah. Um, I know the question. The unicorns are labeled. Yes. Them, so. Okay, so you do see creatures described in the Bible, and also remember words change over time. So our modern depiction of a unicorn is like a single horned horse. There are different views about what that unicorn could have been in the Bible. For example, there's a creature in the Bible called a behemoth. What's a behemoth? Well, when you look at the description that God gives to Job, it says he has a tail like a cedar tree. The cedars of Lebanon, by the way, massive stands of tree, clearly depicting a sauropod dinosaur. So if I said, what do I think the unicorn is? I, it would be unfair. I think if you visit creation.com, but you just recognize that some of the um, words used in the Bible, and by the way, I think that's only in the King James translation, isn't it? Anyway, isn't it unicorn? I'm not sure. I don't think it's in our, e our other English ones. I could be wrong on that. Um, you will see depictions of possibly what type of creature uh, it could have been. But it's not the unicorn that you typically see, uh, which is based on myth and legend. Okay. This one should be quite obvious, but the person asks as well. Is Genesis the first book or is Exodus? First book. In the Bible, it's the first book in the Bible. It wasn't clear. Just okay. But I think it's... Yeah, uh, first book, I don't know if that might be means oldest book. Mm -hmm. And again, there's some debates with scholars about what are the oldest books. A lot of people think the book of Job is, in fact, the oldest book we have in the Bible. We look at the first five books. We believe that Moses is the compiler. He obviously had to have information that was passed down to him. And it's possibly even Noah took that information and records uh, of the pre-flood world. Uh, onto the ark and of course Noah had a lot of stuff given to him by God directly but the first book in the Bible yes clearly in the in the uh, sequence we're meant to read it is how we read it today yes okay this is the last question that we have here could you explain the different kinds of evolution um, oftentimes defenders of evolution will give the evidence from mi microevolution and then say that somehow proves the Big Bang and the evolution of the solar system for example Okay. Is it true? Okay, let me grab that so I can make sure I get the different parts. Yeah, remember in, when I did natural selection, I talked about the difference between micro and macro evolution. So micro evolution are the small changes that you see uh, within a kind. So you might get different types of dogs. Remember I showed the picture of the butterflies. And then sometimes that can lead to new species. Again, man-made word, but nothing new is being created. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we've got a documentary out there called Darwin, The Voyage That Shook the World. And for Darwin's double anniversary in 2009, we retraced his voyage of the Beagle. We went to the Galapagos and everything else. Well, they think that the Galapagos Islands are separated by up to 600 million years of geological evolution. 
and on one island you have marine iguanas. Now marine iguanas actually pretty much they live in the water, they eat seaweed, they can even swallow seawater and then they can excrete the salt. It's quite amazing. And then on another island you've got land iguanas that typically live on the land and they live vegetation on the land. And Darwin was only on the Galapagos for two weeks. And he saw these and of course marine iguanas and land iguanas are separate species. But they've got a full-time research station now on the Galapagos and, and the marine iguanas and the land iguanas have found each other and they're interbreeding. So who told them they were separate species? <laughs> they look different, they live in different environments, but clearly shows they came from um, an original created kind. Another example um, of this uh, microevolution is uh, in the Second World War. Uh, in the London Underground in, in England, they were using those as air raid shelters, as you might recall. And so people were going down. Mosquitoes from the surface followed them down. Okay, Obviously a good food source, people sleeping in the underground tunnels. Within 60 years, those mosquitoes had lost the use of their eyes. And they now plague people in the London Underground, right? and they called it a separate species because it will no longer, no longer interbreed with the parent population it came from just 60 years before and they've given it a new species name. But again, it's a mutation, something is broken, it's easier to break something than to fix it. So when you see microevolution, as I showed earlier, it's usually, and I don't like that term because obviously there's no evolution happening, but it's usually a loss of genetic information or a variation within a created kind. There's usually nothing new ever produced. Evolution requires volumes of new information. Macroevolution are these big changes when you're kind of turning, you know, butterflies into, as I said earlier, biologists. Big changes. We don't see those. Okay? We have see variation within a created kind. But the question was, remember, they say, we see microevolution, therefore evolution is true. Do you remember I said at the beginning, and I gave a warning to the boys and girls, I said, they will say, see, we see creatures change over time. Okay, that's what they're saying there. We see microevolution, therefore evolution is true. It's not evolution of any description. It's just the term that they put on it. So you've got to try to remove the scales from someone's eyes and say, what does evolution require? In the big picture, what does evolution require? It requires new or novel information to produce new functioning organisms that are different. Okay, And everything we see in the natural world shows it doesn't happen, that natural selection causes the information to go in the wrong direction. And because they think microevolution is true, it says here, you've said they believe in the Big Bang and evolution of the solar system. So evolution, a lot of you think about it in just terms of biology. No. Remember I said earlier also, evolution is a belief system. It's a whole of our existence type philosophy. It seeks to explain everything. Why we're here? Their answer is, it's an accident. <laughs> That's why we're here. So it's not just about biology. As I said, you could use geological evolution, how the Earth was shaped, cosmological evolution, that they say there was a big bang uh, billions of years ago. So I think that's what you mean by different types of evolution. They, they, there are only two, micro and macro, when it comes to the biological world. But as I said, it doesn't work for either of them. Information heads in the wrong direction there.